All right, welcome to American Government, third period, fall 2016. We're going to talk about voters and voting behavior, chapter six. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, All right, see, so there's people here. We're excited. We're ready to go. Uh, we have our class split up into Republicans and Democrats. Hopefully that will make things a little bit juicier for our discussions today. All right, so we're going to look at the four section titles really quick, and then we'll get into the objective of section one. So we have the right to vote. And some of these we'll be going through uh, quicker than others because uh, you guys are getting this in uh, the American World class or you've already had it in your history class and we just won't, we won't spend as much time on it. Uh, we'll look at voter qualifications, uh, we're going to look at suffrage and civil rights, and the last one will be looking at voter behavior itself. So let's go to the objectives. Uh, for the right to vote, section one, these are the items that you should be able to answer when we're done with this section. Now, you have, um, you guys are following through on either a Chromebook or on your phone with the notes, so you should have those objectives. When we get down to the end, you can look back and try to answer those. So, first one, how have voting rights changed over time in the United States? Um, actually, let's take 30 seconds, talk to your neighbor, come back and let me know what you think on this one. Go. Eight, two, one. All right, Jersey, who is your partner? Emma is your partner, and predict for me how voting rights have changed in the United States. Women got the right to vote. Okay, that's a great prediction. Let's just be curious to see if it comes true or not, right? I think you already know. Tanner, who is your partner? Gage, okay, and did you guys come up with a prediction? Okay, African Americans being able to write to vote. So you guys know a lot of this from history, so you know um, we can we'll move on to the next one here. What constitutional restrictions exist on the state's power to set voter qualifications? So we'll look at that. This is saying, what can the states do to restrict voters' ability to vote? Uh, looking at the history of the, the right to vote, so we'll go through a couple things here. Obviously, the framers, uh, when they put together the Constitution, uh, it was originally uh, left up to the states to set up that requirement, but they changed that because they realized that uh, states weren't necessarily all going to be in line. So um, they came up with that idea of white male property owners originally. Um, two terms that mean the right to vote is suffrage. And you guys have heard of the suffrage movement. And franchise is another term for voting. It means the same thing. Uh, the electorate is a term that you'll hear. You've probably heard the term electoral college. The electorate, as we talked in Chapter 5, is all the people that are able to vote in your party. That would be your party electorate. The electorate in general is everybody that's eligible to vote. And in the United States, it's a lot of people. Now, we don't get everybody voting, but the electorate is everybody that is uh, given the right to vote. Um, okay, I already mentioned that uh, white male property owners, 21 and older, were uh, the initial voters in the United States. Today, uh, your electorate right now is about 220 million people, um, and it's basically almost every citizen that is 18 years and older has the right to vote in the United States. There are some restrictions, which we'll get into here in just a moment. So how did we get to this point? What happened? We have five distinct time periods or events in history that changed our voting behavior. Um, during the early 1800s up to about the 1830s, slowly states started to remove the religious, the property tax, the tax payment qualifications uh, to vote. They just basically on their own said, we need to get more people voting and we'll take these ones away. The next one, um, the 15th Amendment, which ended race-based race -based voting, was a direct result of what? Gage. Take a guess. What big event ended discrimination towards African Americans in a legal sense? Uh, 
Uh, could have been an act. Lexi? Abolishing slavery, which came with what major event? Civil War. Civil War. Okay, so that Civil War gave us a bunch of things that really changed the way people uh, in the United States legally were described, and it removed all the race stuff. So um, with the 15th Amendment, you couldn't use race to discriminate against someone's ability to vote. Um, in 1920, uh, the 19th Amendment um, restricted voting based on sex. So you couldn't tell a person that they couldn't vote because they were uh, female. Now, 1920, that's less than 100 years ago. So you, you know, your great grandma was unable to vote, even though she might have been 75 at the time, couldn't vote because women didn't have the right to vote at that particular point in time. So we're coming up on that 100 year anniversary. Uh, in Oregon, it was 1912 that women got the right to vote for everything except which office. The presidency, because that's the national one, and that's the one that's not controlled by the states. Okay, in the 1960s, we saw an event, uh, the Vietnam War. We saw some civil rights uh, legislation being passed, which removed uh, poll taxes, literacy tests, um, and also gave um, the opportunity, which we're going to add that one in here, the 26th Amendment, the, the right to a vote at age 18. So that's from about 64, 65 until 1971, there was lots of changes with voting. And uh, literacy tests uh, and poll taxes, uh, the literacy tests for a lot of uh, um, counties in the south would be, uh, you go up and there's a big jar of jelly beans, and if you could guess the exact number of jelly beans in the jar, then you were literate, you were intelligent, and they would let you vote. Um, or they would give you a copy of the uh, state constitution and say, read through this and answer some questions. Well, if you couldn't read to begin with, or if your reading level was pretty low, it's going to be tough to read a constitution, as you guys know. Um, and that made it really difficult for minorities or even the white, uh, uneducated, low economic person to vote. So the South said, we're not discriminating, we're just, you know, White people aren't able to vote, but it's because they're not smart enough. Uh, so we removed all that to give everybody that, that opportunity to vote. And then the 26th Amendment is directly tied to the Vietnam War because we were drafting uh, men at age 18 to go off to war, and yet they couldn't vote. So kind of like no taxation without representation. All right, moving along here. Uh, voting qualifications, so setting those. Um, when we look at the Constitution, it says five things. So the U.S. Constitution says uh, five things. Here they are. That any person whom a state allows to vote for members of the most numerous branch, what's the most numerous branch? Not political party. Of its own legislature must be allowed to vote for members of Congress. So it's, it's basically saying if you are allowed to vote for a member of your state legislature, then you can vote for a member of Congress. Kind of a quirky one. These, are, these get a little bit uh, wordy. But uh, you couldn't deprive, number two, you can't deprive anybody based on uh, their uh, previous condition or of their race. So if they were a slave or not, you can't uh, discriminate against them. Number three is the one where you can't discriminate against women to vote. Um, number four, you can't take a money, you can't force people to pay money to vote, which came into conflict in Oregon a little bit because we have the mail-in ballot, so you have to buy a stamp and put it on the ballot to send your ballot in. True? Can you avoid that, paying that 47 cent potential stamp or tax to get your ballot in? You can. You have to take your ballot to City Hall and deposit it, which in most of our vehicles today it probably cost you 47 cents or more to drive to City Hall, but you wouldn't have to pay for the stamp. Uh, and then you can't take away the right to vote for anybody um, over the age of 18. So that's just saying what we just said before, this is just kind of a little more in a constitutional term. All right, here comes the questions. Get out your ABCs and Ds. Yeah. Like, 
Okay, great question. So um, there are some restrictions for those people uh, who have, their voting rights are taken away. If you're incarcerated, you can't vote. So that means if you're in jail. Some states, if you're a felon, you, you can't vote. Um, if you are deemed mentally incompetent by a court, you can't vote. I mean, there's some people that are just IQ isn't, it's not going to get any better. Um, and, and they can't vote. Um, obviously, if you're not a citizen, um, each state has different requirements for how long it takes to be a citizen to vote. Some states you can plop down and be there 24 hours and say, okay, I'm going to vote. In some states you can't. Or you have to register. I think it's Wisconsin. You just need to show your driver's license. And so it's pretty, it's pretty quick and pretty easy um, for, for some states and, and others. And the whole idea of, of the restriction is to prevent voter fraud, is to prevent people from going in voting twice or voting for somebody else. You know, Oregon probably has more voter fraud than any other state in the union right now because your mail-in ballot's sitting on your table. I mean, you could go home and talk with your parents and influence the way they're going to vote, and they say, okay, we'll just fill out the ballot for me. They just need to sign it, put it in an envelope, send it in, and it counts as their vote even though you're the one that actually did the voting. I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just saying this is a thing that, that could potentially happen because each person gets a ballot it mailed to them in the state of Oregon. And I have a lot of kids who go, well, you know, I sat down with my parents and we talked about it. Because I don't have a vote, and my mom or my dad is kind of wishy-washy and they don't really care anyway, so I influence them to vote this way. So there's, there's nothing illegal about that. Um, if you fill out the ballot and sign their name and turn it in, that's illegal. You don't want to do that. All right, here we go. Suffrage in the United States. A has been gradually extended to more and more citizens. B is granted to property owners only. C is granted to only women. Or D is gradually lessened the number of eligible voters. So get out your cards and respond. I've got some A's. I've got some D's. Now I have some C's. Okay, we're a little bit on the map here. So suffrage is the right to vote. And the best possible answer here is that uh, the right to vote in the United States has been gradually extended to more and more citizens. I don't know how it can get to any more unless we just vote, lower the voting age to 16. I don't see that happening. Um, if a lot of people of ages 18 to 26 would turn out and vote, they might lower the age. But as I told you guys yesterday, which is the least demographic group of voters? 18 to 26. 18, yeah, 18 to 26. Okay. All right. Uh, the minimum voting age in the United States today is? 18. Oh, Max. Everybody has C now. Oh, except for Noah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, the correct answer is 18C. All right. So, let's look at voter qualifications. So, Lexi, this is going to answer your question a little bit more specifically. Um, what are the universal requirements for voting in the United States? What other requirements have states used or still use as voter qualifications? Remember, we're going to answer those. You should be able to answer those when we get through this. These are the objectives. So what does universal mean? Many uses. Many uses or everybody, right? So the universal requirements, that means this is everybody. Uh, three factors that the states require people to meet to be eligible to vote. So these are, they got to have citizenship. They need to prove they're a citizen. Now, each state may do something a little bit different to get that approval, but that's what you have to do. You have to prove citizenship. Um, the next one is age. What's the minimum age? It's 18 for president. Some states will actually let you vote at age 17 in the primaries for the presidential election if you turn 18 before the presidential election. So Oregon's primary was in May. Let's say your birthday is in July. You turn 18 in July. They would let you register and vote in the primary in May because you're going to be a voter in November. Um, the residency, you need to be a resident. And again, I mentioned that before, it's different in different states. So if you're moving out of Oregon, find out what your residency is so that you can make sure that you are a resident so you'll get the opportunity to vote. 
Okay, next. Look at some other things here. Um, Dakota doesn't re require everybody to be citizens. Why does Dakota, do you think, not require people to be citizens of the United States to vote? Because why? Because no one wants to live. Uh, you're real close. Low population. What's that? Uh, there's a population of Native Americans that they want to extend the right to vote to that are on the uh, reservations. Oh, that's a great answer. Um, so literacy. Um, this one's no longer required, but for a long time it was. And I already explained those literacy tests to you guys before. Poll taxes, that was abolished with the 24th Amendment. The poll tax was you, you had to pay. You had to pay a dollar to vote. Well, who are you discriminating against if you're forcing everybody to pay a buck to vote? Or 20, even 25 cents. Yeah, you're discriminating against the poor. And if you are the right uh, established aristocrat uh, running government, do you want the poor voting? Not really, because they're probably not going to vote for you because there's a disconnect there. So let's let's see, how can we keep them? Oh, we can just say that they're not smart enough. That's a literacy test. Or we'll just charge them because it costs money to, to put these polls together and or put the ballots together. It costs money, so let's figure out a way to pay for that. Oh, we'll just, we'll just add a tax. We call it a poll tax. Um, and then that is now gone. Can't do that. Uh, states also have restrictions on the rights of certain members of the population. Okay, and this is Lexi's question before. Mentally incompetent, if you're convicted of a serious crime, felons um, don't necessarily get the operation to vote. But is it going to be different for every state? Yes. Yeah. Yes, because it does just voting is a state's issue, except for presidents, the only national issue. Um, let's say that uh, I walk across the street to Dutch Brothers to get a coffee and I get hit by a log truck and I'm put into a coma um, and when I wake up I'm not functional I can't uh, I mean I can I can talk and I have some mobility or whatever but I'm mentally not there I'm not smart enough to even really figure out how to sign a checkbook anymore I probably shouldn't be voting Okay. Or someone that's born with a, a mental defect um, and they just don't have the conceptual ability to understand what voting does and what voting is. All right, just a quick uh, little um, graph here. It just shows you who's voting. So who cares about a presidential election? Most of the country, almost 80%. This is uh, from uh, 2000 and the 2004 election. So looking at who watches it on television, the, the one we need to add in here is who follows the campaigns or the elections on the internet. Because I bet a lot of people will follow it this year on their phones, on their smartphones, as opposed to watching TV election coverage. Um, who cares? Only 55%. We care who won. But who cares? In a congressional election, 55% that's dropping. As you go down the governmental ladder, we seem to care less, don't we? Look at how many people give money to a presidential campaign. It's just about 5%. And worked for a political party? Very small. Hey, you want to get a good network going, you guys, when you get out of high school and your next four years, your next couple of years, get involved in somebody's election campaign. That will create a really good network for you. Look how many people are actually involved in those. Very few. That network will help you get jobs later on. Just a thought. All right. The three universal requirements states use for a person to be eligible to vote are, is it uh, residence, gender, income, citizenship, property, ownership, and gender, citizenship, residency, and age, or is it income, employment, and age? Adam's going to say smarty. All right, C, good job. It is. And the 24th Amendment forbids the use of what? you guys you got it right pull taxes okay move along section three doing great uh, suffrage and civil rights we are going to uh, skip this because you got all you get all this in your history class 
We talked about the 15th Amendment. That's the big one. Okay, so we skipped Section 3 as that's covered in America and the World. We're going to Section 4, and we are looking at voter behavior. Um, so why do people vote the way they do? Yes, Max. don't want us to have notes on Section 3. I don't think you need to have notes on Section 3. It's not going to be covered in the quiz at all. It's not going to be covered in the quiz at all. Section 3? Section 3 was just the uh, uh, civil rights, voting rights movement of the 60s, which you guys have spent a lot of time on that. Or will be spending a lot of time on it. You, you did today? Perfect timing, Mr. Haas. Okay, so what is the non voting problem and what is its scope? Uh, why do people not vote? Why, or how can we compare the voting behavior of voters and non-voters? So we'll look at those. And then the uh, last one, I believe, here. What are the sociological and psychological factors that affect voting? Okay, remember, we're going to answer these, so you should be able to answer these questions when we get done. These are our objectives for today in Section 4. Voter turnout, presidential elections. Uh, these are some interesting numbers. 54.2% of the uh, population voted in 2000, of eligible voters, not registered voters, eligible voters, 54%. So if you were running for president in 2000, what was the percentage of the population that you needed to get to side with you? Was it 51%? No. It's like 27.2%, right? That's not very much of the population that you had to get to vote for you to become president. Uh, in 2004, it goes up to 60%. In 2008, it was 62.3%. So this is, and this is with Obama, the first African American running for president, it goes up to 62%. We're still not very high. And then it drops off in 2012. Now, It'll be interesting to see what happens in 2016. You have someone that has a fairly extensive governmental experience, not in the executive branch. You have someone that is a, a, a well-known person in the United States, has no governmental experience. It's going to be interesting to see how many people actually turn out and vote a week from today. It's close. It's close. Looking at spending. <laughs> uh, I think this one's going to be off the charts this year, but we'll see. Um, so if you look at 1960, Nixon spends $10 million and Kennedy 9.8. Pretty even. You go to 2012, and Obama has almost spent three quarters of a billion dollars. McCain, a, a quarter of a billion. Uh, Obama again. Now, why is such a big disparity between Obama and McCain? He did the internet. He used the internet. McCain did the old school, hey, I'm going to speak in your town. Come have, it's called the $1,000 dinner, the $10,000 dinner. Uh, you go and you buy a, a, a plate of uh, food for 10 grand and you listen to the candidate speak for 15 minutes and then you're not giving your money to the candidate, you're buying that dinner for $10,000 or $1,000 or $500, whatever it is. And then the candidate uses that as a fundraiser. It's a way around giving that the candidate direct cash, which circumvents all the election laws. All right. But, hey, in 2008 and 2012, our economy must have been doing pretty well because we spent a whole lot of money on the campaign. And now, you know, and they don't, Obama just doesn't have all that in his back pocket. He, his supporters are giving him that. So if they're willing to give him money, they, there must be money out there. All right, non-voters. Millions of Americans do not vote when elections are held. Why? Voter turnout significantly decreases in off-year elections. Two years from tomorrow, or two years from Tuesday, next week, we will have an off-year election. We'll be voting for probably a representative uh, for Congress for Oregon, and we'll vote for some city council people. But there's no president there. Remember that chart that said who cared who won the presidency, 80%? After that, for some reason, we don't care. 
But you guys know that which, which group of government should, the, should be the ones you care about the most? The local stuff, right? Congress, the local, anything that you know is more closely connected to you because the president isn't. All right, so why do people not vote? Well, you might be physically unable. You might be, and, so, and a lot of these are geared towards actually going to the polls. And we don't do that in Oregon. You get a mail-in ballot, so you could actually vote over the course of about three weeks. You know, you could be watching TV and deciding how you're going to vote on a couple things and then put it away and come back and vote later. Most places around the country, you actually have to physically go to a place, like in the precinct, up on that chart in uh, Chapter 5. You go to a polling place. For us, it used to be the convention center. You'd walk in. You'd wait in line. They would, a poll would open up. You'd go into the poll. You'd close the curtain. You would get out your cheat sheet so you knew what you were voting on, because if you try to make all your decisions while the ballot's there, it takes forever. You would vote for all the people you're going to vote for. You get the ballot, you walk over, you put it into the ballot box, and you walk out. Now, in some places, on the East Coast especially, especially in some of the poor neighborhoods, people were waiting in uh, the 2008 election for up to six hours to vote. Because they, so many people turned out to vote than normal that the precincts weren't ready for that many people. You just had to wait in line. Um, most voters don't vote because of voter apathy. Number one reason. Voter apathy means they're what? They don't care. They're lazy. They don't care. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't matter to me. Doesn't affect me. I don't care. That's why they don't vote. They don't see the connection of your government to their daily lives. And and that's true for most people, but most people you know, most people still vote. Um, most people get involved in government when government does something negatively towards them. That's when they get fired up and want to get involved. I made the mistake of going to city council uh, about 13 years ago now and complaining that our playgrounds and, and our park system in the city of Seaside just sucked. And I told them, I mean, I said literally in front of city council, it, our parks suck in this town. You guys need to do something better to get them fixed. And uh, then I ended up being selected to be the chairman of the Seaside Parks Advisory Committee. So now it became my task. So I got mad that our parks were bad and then I got put in charge of fixing them. Uh, that's kind of how government works. Um, you get you get upset about something and then you go try to make it, make it work and, and maybe you're part of the solution. Um, voting is inconvenient. We have a lot of things to vote on. There's a thing called voting fatigue. You're throwing out the ballot, and you're like, oh, gosh, this is, I don't know. And you just kind of skip some things at the end. Or trying to drive to the polls to go vote or get there physically might be difficult. For Oregon, it's easy. It gets mailed to you, put a stamp on it, mail it back. As long as you put it in the mail by when. Who knows? No. No. It, it has to be in by this Friday in the mail by Friday or it won't count because it will arrive at the poll afterwards. You can take it to the ballot box on the 8th, on Tuesday the 8th. Okay, um, how many people, somewhere, a little piece of them, think that maybe their vote just wouldn't count anyway? we got some electoral collegators over there. My vote, is my vote really going to count? <laughs> Government, the, the one thing that to refute that, if you're thinking about that, is government makes choices based on how you vote. If you vote certain people into office and they just barely get in there, they don't have a lot of support. So they don't know if what they're doing is what everybody really wants. But if you get a lot of people voting for a particular candidate, they can come into office and go, hey, everybody really supports what I'm doing, or most people really support what I'm doing. Therefore, I feel strong about making decisions. And the last one, they distrust politics or the candidates themselves or they don't understand. You got people right now saying, how in the world could Hillary Clinton be the, the nominee for president for the Democrats? She can't even control her emails. She's stealing secrets from the federal government, and it's just crazy. And then you have people saying, how in the world could you vote for Donald Trump? The guy says that he is an expert on everything. How could he possibly be an expert on everything? This scares me. So that creates a little bit of uh, angst and distress there. 
All right. Um, so looking at behavior, what are we learning? Uh, the results from elections can be gleaned by studying the results of confidential voting compared to the population makeup of a particular sector. So why are people voting certain ways in certain areas? It's just like Oregon. Where did most of the Democrats live? In the valley. So we vote a lot of Republican in the rural areas, Democrat in the valley, and Oregon is going to vote for who in the presidential election? They're going to go for they're going to vote Clinton because we have more Democrats that vote in this state. Um, you know, just collecting data and polls to try to figure out how people are voting ahead of time. We do that all the time. You guys hear who's leading in the polls today? Who is leading? It doesn't mean she's going to win. No, but do, do, when, we, when we divulge that information, does that skew people to not vote? Because, ah, oh, Hillary's going to win anyway, I guess we will vote. He could. Um, and political socialization, you guys, that's just going through the process of learning how the, politi the political system works. All right, social factors. Do these look familiar? Yeah, we basically talked about it the other day. The only one that's really different on here is geography, where you live. Okay? If I live in uh, Burns, Oregon, uh, am I more likely to be a Republican or a Democrat? Republican. Am I more likely to vote? No. I don't know. I don't know if geography has a di uh, dictates. Probably more likely to vote if I'm living out there because I probably have the means. And um, also, my ballot gets sent to me. If I live in Dade County, Florida, Miami, uh, Florida, one of the poorest places in the United States, am I more likely to vote? Probably not. My bigger concern that day is, am I going to get food? Rather than, am I going to stand in line for six hours and cast my ballot? Okay. Uh, looking at some psychological factors, party identification, you know, some people are real loyal to their party, and they don't even worry about finding out the information. They just say, I'm a Democrat. I'm always going to vote for the Democrats. Um, candidates and issues. We're finding out about all kinds of stuff on our candidates and the issues through the Internet and television now. So it's really easy for us, and that's why we're having that voting breakdown. Okay. Have you heard the term lesser of two evils? You hear that a lot in the last couple of elections. Well, I guess I'll vote this person because it's the lesser of two evils. Not satisfied with the candidates, but you know you got to vote for one. So which one is going to impact you negatively the least? Which is a, is a sad way to look at it, but maybe, you know, that's where our politics is going. Uh, hopefully the next generation, you guys, can kind of change that behavior. All right. Uh, the reason why most non-voters do not vote is... A, B, C, or D. I got a lot of Bs out there. They believe their vote will not matter. Yeah, I would say that's the best possible answer. If voter apathy was E, which one would you choose? E. Oh, good job. Voters' choices are affected by their income, occupation, education, their religious and ethnic background, or all of the above. Hunter? D? Or B? D is the correct answer. All right. Nice job, you guys. Um, so we are, that concludes our lecture for today. Good work.